Thank you for joining us tonight. On screen, we are showing a pre-event slideshow. The live logo appears in gold on a white background alongside the text, live from NYPL presents, I am a girl from Africa, Elizabeth Yamiaro with Jillian Tett, April 20th, 2021, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. This slide contains an image of the featured book. The cover shows a photograph of the author in profile from the shoulders up against a bright yellow background. The text reads, Elizabeth Yamiaro, a memoir, I am a girl from Africa. I am a girl from Africa is available for purchase online from the library shop, on.nypl.org slash shop live. Proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Reserve a copy for free with a New York Public Library card. Visit tonight's event page to find this title in a variety of formats nypl.org slash live. The next slide shows recommended reading. Elizabeth Yamiaro suggests these books for further reading. There are images of three books. We Should All Be Feminists by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, Becoming by Michelle Obama, and I Am Malala by Malala Yousafzai. Check out the full list and reserve these titles by visiting tonight's event page nypl.org slash live. Hi, everyone. Good evening. And thanks for joining us at Live from NYPL. I'm Faye Rosenfeld, and I am the Vice President of Public Programs at the New York Public Library. Tonight, we are honored to be celebrating the publication of Elizabeth Yamiaro's new memoir entitled, I Am a Girl from Africa. If you are among the 1.5 million people who have seen Elizabeth's electrifying TED talk, you already know about her deep-seated belief in the power of community, in the idea that what we share is more powerful than what divides us. It was this belief that inspired her to launch He for She, the incredible global initiative that aims to end gender inequality by galvanizing men and boys to take on the fight as their own. And when you read her book, which is fantastic, and which you can purchase right now from the library shop, you will learn much more about the source of that conviction, about all of the experiences that shaped her, led her to launch He for She and other initiatives and to pursue a life dedicated to community and humanitarian activism. This fundamental belief in the importance of community and our collective responsibility for one another undergirds everything we do here at the New York Public Library. We know that this work is more important than ever. And I just have to say that it's impossible on this night not to reflect just for a moment on the actions and the impact of a 17 year old girl in Minneapolis named Darnella Fraser, whose sense of responsibility to others caused her to turn on her video camera and document the brutal torture and murder of George Floyd at the hands of a police officer. So on behalf of the library, I wanna say that it's a very special privilege to have Elizabeth launch her book with us tonight and to have this opportunity to learn from her and to be inspired by her. We are also thrilled to have the journalist and author Jillian Tett back at the NYPL this evening, joining Elizabeth in conversation. Jillian is chair of the US editorial board of the Financial Times and her award-winning work covers a range of economic, financial, political, and social issues. She has a new book coming out in June entitled Anthrovision. Before I bring them on stage, I wanna let you know that we have many more fantastic authors and guests joining us at live in the weeks ahead. Tomorrow night, Joshua Jelly Shapiro joins us to talk about his latest book, Names of New York, together with Suketu Mehta. Next week on April 29th, in honor of National Poetry Month, we have an evening of readings, discussion, and music celebrating 1,000 years of Persian poetry by women. Both of these programs, as well as tonight's, are presented in conjunction with the library's first ever World Literature Festival, which also includes virtual programs in many different languages hosted by branches around the city. You'll find information about all of this on our website, and we hope that you'll join us. In just a moment, I'll bring Elizabeth and Jillian on screen, but just before I do that, a few quick housekeeping items. First, our speakers will be glad to answer your questions. If you have questions, you can send them at any time during the chat, using the chat or in the Google form um, that you'll find on the event page, or you can email publicprograms at nypl.org. They will get to as many as they can. Second, a brief disclaimer. The library values your privacy very much. And in that spirit, and in the interest of transparency, we want you to know that while tonight's video and chat are viewable on the New York Public Library website, they are both in fact being hosted by YouTube. 
by participating in the chat, you might share some data about yourself, which the library does not control. For more details about all of this, you can visit our FAQ along with Google's privacy policy and the library's privacy policy, all available on the event page. And last, tonight's event will have captioning. You can access that through the stream text link shared in the chat or by clicking the closed captioning button. Okay, let's get to it. Please welcome Elizabeth Yamayaro and Jillian Tett. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much indeed for that fantastic introduction. It is indeed an extraordinary night to be listening to the story of Elizabeth Nyamoyaro because in the last few months, America has been ripped apart by hatred, anger, bitterness, prejudice, lots of discussion about the unfairness of life, lots of negativity. And yet, if there's one thing that shines through this remarkable book that we're going to be hearing about tonight. It is the spirit of perseverance, resilience, communal travel, and the recognition that even in very dark places, it's possible to find not just a spirit of healing, but also hope. So it's wonderful to have you today talking to us all about your amazing book, Elizabeth. Um, I've read it. It is really quite remarkable. The minute I read it, I told my two teenage daughters that they should read it too. They're at school here in Manhattan and told them to read it to basically open their eyes and understand the world and also savor in that spirit of hope. But before we start discussing your book and your extraordinary story um, and hopefully having lots of questions from the audience, and I want to stress, do please start asking your questions as soon as you want, because I want to weave them into conversation to really make this a communal experience discussing these themes. I know you'd like to start, Elizabeth, by reading a little passage of your book to really set the frame and set the stage for tonight's discussion. Thank you so much, Gillian. We have an African saying that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, in my case, it still takes a village to raise this woman. So I want to start by acknowledging my wonderful friends and family who are joining us today, as well as my incredible colleagues and team that are all here. I'm going to read a short passage from the book. And to give you context, I was born during my country's revolution in Zimbabwe. And when I turned six, the war ended. We were trying to liberate ourselves from British colonial rule. And this is the moment when I find out that the war has ended. And I hear this from my gogo, my grandmother, who was raising me in a small African village in Zimbabwe. Just a few minutes before this passage, I'm at home all by myself doing chores when suddenly I hear a woman screaming and I realize that it's my gogo but I don't know what's going on. And so I run towards her. She's coming up the hill. There is just dust around her. She is in state of distress. And I'm quite nervous because I've never seen it look this way. So I literally throw myself into her arms and this is what happens next. Gogo's knees buckle beneath her. She is gripping me in her arms like a baby. She would not let go. And so we land together on the ground with a thump. My face is pressed against her breast and my legs stretch out onto the ground. I hear Gogo's heartbeat in my ear. Do doom, do doom, do doom, faster and faster, trying to catch her breath as it keeps tumbling away from her. I want to say something but I don't know what to say. Instead, I throw my tiny arms across her shoulders, trying to comfort her without words, praying silently to God. I want Gogo to stop crying, but instead she opens her mouth and wells. She's sobbing, freeing herself from her sorrow, wailing like a child. I don't understand what has happened. But I want to take Gogo's pain away, the way that she always takes my pain away, protecting me from sickness and hunger and every sadness. I press myself against her and pray, God, please heal her. 
Gobo says again more clearly this time. The radio announced Tasununguka. I still do not understand her meaning, but she's no longer crying and I wanted to keep it that way. So I nod and repeat the word in his shoulder. Tasununguka. This is the word Gogo has heard on a small, small radio, which he takes to the field with her when there's enough money for batteries. We listen to music and weather and news as we work together. I pull away from Gogo and smile at her. She smiles back, then lets out a huge laugh rumbling from deep within a chest that feels as loud as thunder. Still laughing, she lifts me off her lap, sets me onto the ground, and begins to sing and dance like a mad woman. Her bare feet storm the ground with tremendous force. Her arms flap in the air like the powerful birds that soar over our good forest and drop down to steal fish from our river. Gogo's loud laughter calls the light back in her eyes. She is absolutely ecstatic. I think she sounds as hysterical as the hyenas in the hyena forest. Gogo's sudden happiness confuses me just as much as her crying did. But I'm relieved that she's happy. And so I join her mad woman dance, following her feet in their one, two, one, two, one, two pattern. We dance in a wild circle as dust swirls around us, panting as our lungs run out of air. We are laughing with our souls, emptying out all our pain like water being poured into the ground. When Gogo abruptly stops singing, I stop with her. Fed beads of sweat mixed with dried tears on our faces. I search Gogo's face for answers. What is happening? She says nothing. Instead, she bends down, locks her hands under my arms, and lifts me off the ground until my feet are dangling in the air. Looking directly into my eyes, she smiles and proclaims loudly, Tasununguka! We are free. We are free, my dear child. We are free. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth. And I think what that passage shows is not merely that this is a very powerful and emotional book, and you have an extraordinary story to share, but also you are a very good writer and a very good reader as well. Um, so the story you tell is essentially of how you started your life in Zimbabwe in a fairly small, humble hut, living with your go-go. And then when you were eight years old, you almost starved to death during a famine of the yes. sort I'm sure many people watching have seen on television screens, hopefully donated to help relieve through various philanthropic efforts but cannot actually imagine having lived through themselves. Tell us briefly what happened when you almost died in the famine in Africa. My life literally got turned upside down. I think the life of my entire community prior to this drought that happened when I was eight years old, yeah. I lived in this beautiful and idyllic village. You know, our village sat on a small hill. It was surrounded by these rolling green pastures at the bottom of those pastures where I was filled, where we grow in abundance of food. And I grew up literally as part of a community whereby we did everything together. We farmed together, we shared all our food together, and we grew in abundance of that food. And it was a way for us to maintain our dignity and pride. You know, the land wasn't just a source of livelihood. It was really how we took pride of being Africans and being part of this community. But then when I turned eight, a severe drought devastated our village and suddenly everything died. The crops wilted, the rivers dried up, our livestock perished, and we're left with nothing to eat and nothing to drink. 
And it was just a very, very gut-wrenching experience because suddenly we also lost our sense of purpose because, you know, when you have your land, you get up in the morning, you have a sense of purpose. You know exactly what you're going to do. You're going to be in your field, working the field, taking care of yourself. And one day I was just so weak from hunger. I hadn't eaten for several days because there was nothing in the village. And I went in search of berries in this field, in this uh, forest that sat at the bottom of the village and there was nothing. And I remember thinking, I just have to make it back up the hill to our village. And I collapsed on the ground and I, I couldn't, I couldn't move. So what saved you? So what saved you? Because, I mean, this story is very powerful. I mean, and by the way, anyone watching should just think about what it means when we hear about those abstract discussions about climate change, which are unfolding in Washington right now, and what it's doing. People often say casually, oh, it's the most vulnerable communities who suffer worse from climate change. But there you were, age eight, terrible drought in your village. What saved you? As I'm drifting in and out of consciousness, I feel a shadow over my body and I have a sense of relief. Someone has come to find me. And indeed, someone had come to find me. When I open my eyes, I see this girl wearing a blue uniform and she has a bowl of porridge and she gives me this bowl of porridge and gives me a sip of water and that is the moment that saved my life and i would learn a few years later that this girl in a blue uniform was indeed an aid worker with the united nations and that's the moment that changed my life i remember thinking i too just want to be like her so that one day i can save the lives of others in a way that my life had been saved so you are now, and this is an extraordinary thing, the, your life was saved when you're eight years old by a UN worker. You decide that you want to become a UN worker yourself. I mean, that must have seen an absolutely laughable, unimaginable dream. But your book tells a story about how gradually, through extraordinary tenacity, you managed to try and move towards that. Um, when you look back at your story, I mean, tell us briefly, you eventually left your original village and went to live with your birth mother um, and went to school. Did you ever actually imagine that you would actually get the education coming from that village? Because you didn't speak English then, did you? Um, get the education to ever leave Zimbabwe? No, it was such an incredible moment, but it was also a moment that was riddled with so many challenges because yes at the age of 10 another drought hits my village and I at this point to ensure my survival I'm sent to live in the city and I end up initially living with my own bad parents who I had not known since I was a child but then ended up moving within a year to the city to live with an aunt who was kind enough and uncle who were kind enough to send me to this British school so the opportunity of going to school was just remarkable but at the same time, there I was at a school where I didn't speak the language. I had never really met any British people and the, the school was a British school. And suddenly I found myself questioning everything about myself. You know, I was very different to everyone else there. I was the little girl from a small village. I questioned the color of my skin. I questioned, was my hair too curly? Was my accent too thick? And I even developed a stutter uh, as a result of the trauma that I felt being at this school. And so you survived that. And again, it's very moving to kind of see from a child's perspective what it means to feel inadequate because of the color of your skin and how you look. Mm -hmm. um, you then managed by really quite remarkable circumstances to get yourself out of Zimbabwe across to London. And in many ways, I find the passage of what happened to you in London even more astonishing because you arrive in London with 250 pounds in your pocket, a dream of working for the UN, and yet you end up finding it almost impossible to get a job, sharing a bedsit with a whole bunch of Ukrainians um, and struggling and surviving. I mean, I do find that, I mean, and in many ways, that's a story of so many immigrants who arrive with a dream and no resources in London, New York, or anywhere else, isn't it? Yes, there were really two key moments for me with that experience. I had decided that nothing was going to stop in the way of my dream. And I decided that I was going to go to London and work for the UN. It didn't matter to me that I didn't know anyone in London. I had no friends or family in London and I had 250 pounds to my name. And thankfully, just because my gogo, -go, my grandmother 
had had to sell her livestock to buy me a ticket to be there. But then, yes, everything felt and looked different. And in so many ways, it was also a very traumatic thing because I realized it was my first time out of the African continent that there was a stigma about the place where I come from and who I was as an African, which had never been really an issue for me. I knew who I was, but everything became something that I had to constantly defend because the way that people perceived Africans was that of us as lesser than, as inferior. And it was really heartbreaking to see that. But I also realized during this moment that a lot of this misperception didn't come from a place of hate, but just for misinformation. People didn't know. People knew what they saw through the television, through these fundraising commercials. But to speak to your thing about the, the youth hostel and the Ukrainian, I also found my community. And that's one remarkable thing about the immigrant community, that we always find a way to uplift each other. And it was through that sense of community in this youth hostel that was filthy that I was able to find a sense of belonging and also a way for me to actually stay in London and pursue my dream. Yes, I mean, one of the, one of the moving passages is the way that the immigrants in London were, as you say, supporting each other in this youth yeah. hostel um, in a way that, again, is far too often ignored or overlooked by yeah. people who are lucky enough to have an established position in life. It's as if we screen out half of the world around us and the people who are actually literally around us struggling to survive and finding very creative ways to do that. Um, but you then got yourself to London, to LSE, London School of Economics, which again was remarkable. You wiggled your way through sheer tenacity um, into the job in the prized United Nations. You then finally made it to New York, to the UN. Um, when you got to New York, to the UN, did it live up to your dreams and the hopes that you had, you know, been nurturing for so long? It was, I think, just overwhelming. It was just overwhelming. I remember just saying to myself, look, Gogo, like it's my grandmother, look where I am, like look what has happened, because it was a, a, a really a, a dream for me to do this work and being there and recognizing that where I was born had not limited my ability to dream big. I mean, I was after all a small African girl in a small village with a dream that was bigger than my own uh, circumstances and even what was seen as being possible by most people. So the idea that I could be there, that I had made it, I was very proud of that. Um, and again, I was more than, if anything else as well, I was just really proud of my community who had instilled this idea and this belief in me that who I was mattered and that the best part of who I am is actually where I come from. And so, yeah, I, I felt very proud and because I knew that this was also a dream that was bigger than my own dream. It was a bigger for my entire community to see ourselves represented in places that have often seen us as invisible and excluded us. But you see, one of the things I find fascinating about the book, again, is that, you know, as a journalist who has worked around the world, been in sort of, you know, been in war zones, um, covered governments a lot, it's so easy for us as journalists to be critical of the UN to dismiss it, to regard it as a bureaucratic monstrosity. You know, I mean, certainly in the Trump era, there were non-stop attacks on the UN. It's seen as being sort of something that doesn't work very well. And yet you came in with this passion to try and make the UN be upheld as a force for good. Um, do you still think it can do that? I mean, do you still feel as positive about the UN as you did when you first arrived? Well, more than ever, I mean, I wouldn't be here had it not been for the United Nations. I am an avid advocate and a firm believer that the world is so much better because the UN is part of that world. Obviously, we can't gloss over some of the you know, challenges that the UN has. Even the Secretary General has written a piece about the bureaucracy and how we can bog us down. But at the end of the day, I think if we're able to look at actually what the UN stands for, in some of the agencies within the UN, like UN Women, uh, which is a, the greatest honor of my life has been to serve under Pumzim Labunduka, who was the head of UN Women, and my colleagues with UN Women. We are fighting one of the biggest inequalities in the world, gender inequality, which, again, it's crazy to think that we're in 2021 
in no country in the world is it achieved gender equality. So I think things would be worse without the UN. And it's remarkable that their colleagues who are working tirelessly, you know, more than myself in some cases to create the change that needs to be created. Well, that's one reason why I say your story is so powerful and so uplifting. Um, but I'm curious, so you came in to work eventually on the gender side, which is where you are now. Um, and in many ways, the initiative that made you most famous within the UN was the He for She initiative. Um, tell us what inspired that. And did you expect that to have the impact that it has? In fact, tell us what exactly it is, because there may be yeah. the one thing who don't actually know what it is. So the truth is, I think we're all sick and tired as a society of hearing the same questions over and over again, which are really unhelpful. Every time when something bad happens to a woman, when a woman is a victim uh, of, of violence, the question is, well, what was she wearing? Well, what was she doing all by herself at night? Well, you know, she deserved to be, you know, bad things to happen to her. And I just think, you know, my colleagues and I, we looked at ourselves and we thought, this can be the society that we all aim to create, whereby we are teaching women and girls to fear men as if to say men are some kind of monsters that are only there to attack women, because that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, I am surrounded by remarkable men that want to be on the right side of history, that want to create true societies of equality. And so my colleagues and I will work together to create a movement called He For She, which was a rallying call for those men that want to do the right thing to step up to the plate and work alongside women in creating a gender equal world. Because one of the things that was fascinating for me at the time was that there was almost a perception, and in some cases still remains a perception, that the issue of gender inequality is an issue for women led by women, as if to say men don't have a gender or are part of that, or, or part of that society. So he for she was really a galvanizing a movement to engage men. And as you said, it was remarkable because within three days, we saw at least a, a, one man in every single country in the world join he for she. And there was 1.2 billion online conversations within those first five days of men sort of saying, we want to be part of this, count me in. Well, that's remarkable. And you do tell, it's been your book that, you know, one of the things that drove you to do this was the fact that in your own remarkable life, um, you had been helped by some very wonderful men along the way. And actually want to acknowledge that and actually remove some of the bitterness and anger that's often characterized gender discussions. Yes, no, I mean, indeed, this is really a story about how when everyone is involved, everyone benefits. You know, the idea that men have been excluded from the gender equality movement is also the reason why the progress is very slow. I mean, we know this, Jillian, that it's going to take us at least another 100 years to achieve gender equality. So I knew, again, because of our collective humanity and the fact that I was brought up as part of a community, that because men were still making all the decisions, you know, ultimately this issue really is about power, right? Who has the power? how they use it and for whose benefit. And right now we live in a society when men still hold the majority of power across all levels of society. And so I knew that because men are part of the problem, then they have to be part of the solution. And so this is really what was instrumental in creating the movement. Right. I want to ask you, why did you decide to write this book now? I mean, what prompted you to do it right now? Do you think the message is particularly important at the moment? Yes, it is. But this has been a journey, right? This book is about community, but it's also a book about communities. It's a story about my own African community who have uplifted me, you know, and it continue to uplift me to be the person that I am today. But as a humanitarian, having now done this work for more than two decades and traveled around the world, I've seen time and time again communities who are often seen as, you know, who are actually invisible. You know, society almost doesn't even want to talk about them, acknowledge them as, as protagonists of their own stories. And I realized at some point that if we don't tell our own stories, then someone else will. And it's not always going to be through the right lens or the right narrative. So I really wanted to tell my story to, for two reasons. One is to inspire other people to see what's possible when we choose to make a difference to the lives of others. I'm only here today because one girl 
decided to work for the UN, ended up saving me with a bottle of porridge. And I have also been able to make a small contribution to the world. But the other um, aspect of this is just recognizing that we're living in a much more divided world with rising inequalities, whether that's income inequality, racial inequality. I mean, look at what just happened, you know, here in America. I also wanted people to realize that real sustainable change is going to take all of us, not just the UN, not just the governments, but all of us as citizens. So the idea is to hopefully inspire everyone to see that no one is too small to make a difference, right? If a small malnourished girl from a small African village has been able to create some level of small change in the world, just imagine the power that we all have to create change. Well, in terms of, I mean, one of the things that I find absolutely heartbreaking right now is the degree to which the pandemic has set back the cause of equality so dramatically. And one of the consequences of living on Zoom is that we have the illusion we're talking to everyone across the world, but our focus, wherever we are, has become very localized. And most people in America don't know just how drastically um, poor regions, low-income countries, have actually slipped back in the last year yeah. or two and are likely to slip back at the cost of terrible suffering for women and children. I mean, that must make you feel a bit despairing, doesn't it? That so much of the progress that's been done by the UN and other bodies in the last decade is being undone right now. Yeah, I mean, we have indeed lost two decades of progress. So again, if there was never, it was, if there was ever a moment where we all need to recognize that we all have to play our small part, this is now, this, this is the moment. And again, my, my hope is that this story and so many other stories inspire all of us to, to do just that. I mean, one of the biggest issues, as you rightly point out, is the issue of domestic violence. You know, we don't often think about this. We've been in isolation now for a year, and some of us are lucky to live in safe homes. Some women have ended up trapped with their, you know, with their abusers. And that's just really, really disheartening. But as an optimist, I actually feel that this is the moment to issue a bigger call to action, and I hope the book does that. So, When you look at things like the American situation and the level of polarization and anger we've seen erupt in the last year, um, do you think this book has a message about how people should be thinking about that and dealing with it? Indeed, the, one of the core themes that anchors the entire book is this ancient African philosophy of Ubuntu. And literally Ubuntu is core to our African cultures and it literally means I am because we are. And it's this recognition that we are all connected by our shared humanity, right? And because of this connection, what impacts one of us will eventually impact all of us in various ways. And I think if the past year has taught us anything, it is really this truth, right? That what happens in one part of the world can indeed impact people everywhere. And one of my hope is that when we recognize our shared humanity, because a lot of these issues that you're talking about comes when we dehumanize others, when we other the other, when we don't think that actually, when we actually, almost negate the fact that despite our differences, the color of our skin, our religion, where we come from, at the core of it all, we are all human beings. We are all part of one shared humanity. And actually what we share is much more powerful than what divides us. And embracing this, I think will help us move in the right direction. You know, I've seen Ubuntu really use, be used as a healing tool in my continent whether that was in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, you know, is a tool for reconciliation. So what needs to happen in my humble opinion is we need people to embrace this understanding of Ubuntu and recognize that change happens when we actually work together in solidarity with each other. So one of the things that's remarkable about your book and the tone of your book and your story is that you don't present yourself as a victim, um, you know, I say your book throbs through with resilience and positivity. Um, you know, you say at one stage, you know, how rich and triumphant and harrowing and remarkable the path of my life has been. I've experienced and witnessed so much to arrive at this place in my life. 
from my humble upbringing in a small village in Zimbabwe to my unlikely and turbulent path to the United Nations. You know, it's not a victim book. And yet, if you look across what the story of so much of American media and discussions about race and about inequality is, there's often a victim aspect to this. Do you think we need, need to basically move a bit away from the victim focus onto a more positive narrative about opportunity instead? That's a very hard thing for me to say. I think it all comes down to the individual, right? I'm able to do this because I'm able to always look at the world, you know, with so much optimism because <laughs> as someone who grew up as part of a community raised on Ubuntu values, one of the things that I know without a doubt is that if I'm to fall, someone will catch me, right? Because I'm, I belong to a community that is supportive and that mm. I'm unequivocally the living proof that I am because we are. But I think it's also very, um, I think it would be perhaps insensitive to ask people to not express their pain. It is painful. It is very, very painful to know that you're being discriminated simply because of the color of your skin. You know, it is a burden sometimes to be a woman of color, to be a man of color, to be a minority. And so I think we have to allow people to express their emotions, how it suits them and honor that and let them heal because there's a healing that needs to happen. And that healing also only happens when we're able to acknowledge their pain, you know, have the challenges that we are simply saying we can't breathe, you know, and if you can't breathe, you can't breathe and you have to let that pain be felt. Yeah, no, I think that's very well put. I mean, to put another way, do you think part of the problem today is that you did grow up in a community where people were looking out for each other and there was Mbutu. Do you think that one of the problems afflicting the so-called rich countries, you know, or the so-called developed countries is that there simply isn't enough of that sense of communal spirit or looking out for each other? Yeah, I mean, again, it's difficult to uh, to blanket an entire continent just as much as we try and not blanket Africa as a country. Um, but but indeed, I you know I've seen pockets. My in laws are from Tennessee, and their culture, the sense of community, the the spirituality is very much similar to my own upbringing in an African village. But I've also lived in big cities like London and New York and where that sense of community is in there. And we've seen what it does, you know, it, it really harms people. We've seen people have mental health issues. We've seen people get depressed because they feel so isolated. So I do think generally speaking, yes, there is a need for that. There is a need for us to recognize that at the end of the day, the only way that we can truly uplift ourselves is by uplifting others and those around us. So I'm curious, um, have you gone back to the communities where you grew up and spoken to them? And what, what does the village where you grew up make of what you've done? What does your family make of what you've done? Yes, I mean, I go home every single year, except for this past year because of the pandemic. I mean, I'm very much an African child, you know, like I, I have, I need this. I need to be back home. It nourishes my soul. It's, uh, and my community is incredibly proud of me, but they are not so much proud about the big title at the UN. I think what they're most proud of and what I'm most proud of is really what I've been able to accomplish you know, as an African, as part of our Ubuntu, when I was young, my gogo taught me what it meant to dream with the Ubuntu values. And I remember her saying to me, my dear child, your dream has to be big enough. It has to be big enough for all of us as Africans because there's plenty, plenty of us. And so she then explained that a dream can be for one, but it can also be for many. And so I knew, and this is the, I think the, the thing that gave me the most energy in trying to push against all obstacles was knowing that me being able to achieve my dream would also uplift my own community and hopefully my own continent. And with some luck, maybe some parts of the world as well, which again, I'm incredibly humbled that I've been able to do that through my work. Well, I must say again, one of the reasons why I found your book so moving when I picked it up and started reading it and told my own teenagers here in Manhattan to read it is because, you know, many of us, you know, who are watching have, you know, got children often living with extraordinary material blessings, often living lives where essentially they have so many 
expectations put on them and so much, frankly, sense of entitlement that capturing that sense of hunger and dream and drive and determination and appreciation for the material things that people take so much for granted is, is a challenge, frankly. Um, yeah. And again, it's one of the things that comes out so clearly in your book is your gratitude throughout for simple, simple things. Just having a basic bed in a, in a very dirty hostel in London um, is something yeah. which is very moving. Well, thank you for saying that. In fact, people always ask me, how are you such an optimist when things are falling, falling apart around the world or, you know, things are devastating? And I always say that my optimism is very much intertwined with my gratitude, because, as you say, you know, when you're able to appreciate the smallest of all things, I remember as a child, you know, I ended up being moved around quite a lot. I, if I wasn't in the village with my gogo, my grandmother, I was with my parents in a very impoverished township, set, you know, township community on the outskirts of Harare, or I was in the nice school living in the city with my aunt. And it was quite destabilizing in the beginning as a child. And I then made a decision. I thought, well, there's very little that I can change in terms of how I moved around but I could always choose happiness. I could always choose to focus on the smallest thing that made me happy that day. And so, as you say, even now, you know, me getting up and having a hot shower, I'm already happy and I'm very optimistic because I got a shower that I never got growing up in a small village. And I think these things are so important to me, being able to link my gratitude, my happiness, and of course, my ability to remain optimistic. Well, I must say that I think if that spirit could be shared more widely across Manhattan and elsewhere, suddenly half of the psych psychiatrist business would no longer be around. Um, but it just brings me, just reminds me of, I, I, was, I was trained as a cultural anthropologist before I became a journalist. I did my field work in a place called Tajikistan. And one of the daughters of one of the families I lived with came to live with me in New York for a while. And my own teenage daughters were amazed that she always did the washing up. And they kept saying, why don't you use a dishwasher? And she explained she'd never actually, you know, she wasn't used to dishwashers. It was basically washing up. And actually that there was, in a funny kind of way, joy in washing up, but doing yeah, those daily yeah. rituals by hand. So for my own pampered teenagers, it was a very, very good lesson. I think we learned far, far more and got far more from it um, <laughs> through that kind of lesson. So, um, but we got a fantastic question here from the audience, which is, what was it like when you joined the team at the UN in a sea of white faces as an African woman? So I was actually, my very first entry point in the UN was with UNAIDS. And actually I have to say that there was a lot of diversity. You know, the UN usually is very good at diversity. I think the one area that we've often lagged on is the senior leadership. And yes, so sometimes I think as I progressed with my career, there was sort of less and less, you know, women of color in particular at the, at the top leadership uh, positions. I mean, this is the reality. It's not just my own experience. I think it's important to acknowledge that already being a woman, you know, is it comes with its own challenges. You know, we have to prove ourselves constantly in order to be seen as equal, in order to be valued in the same way. We still live in a society where a woman can do exactly the same job as a male colleague and still not get paid the same amount of money. Uh, but then of course the intersectionality of gender and race is something else, right? Because then as a woman of color, you just have to learn to over, you know, to over deliver because your ability is a double question. Can she actually do it? How did she get here? What is she doing here? And so I think that's the biggest takeaway from me that we are still a long way to go. I mean, it's incredible for the first time in the UN history under the current Secretary General Guterres, we actually have reached parity in his cabinet. But obviously there's a lot more work that needs to happen. Right, right. Um do you feel at all optimistic that attitudes and perceptions of Africa are changing at the moment? No, I don't. I don't. And I can get really, really passionate about this. The reason why the book is called I'm a Girl from Africa is also a declaration for who we are. You know, one of the things that I found when I first moved to, to the UK, as I said, um, was this perception of Africa that is so different to how we see ourselves. And 
I wanted this book to say, I am a girl from Africa. I am proud of where I come from. And we are proud of where we are as, as people because we are not this lazy, helpless people that are portrayed in fundraising commercials. We do not define ourselves by the enormity of our challenges, but by our resilience in working together and uplifting each other as children of the African soil. So I think we're a long way to, to, to get there. I also, the title is also very provocative, right? Because it says I'm a girl from Africa. What is Africa? It's not a country. Africa is a continent, right? And the portrayal usually is Africa as a country. But I wanted to be able to start the conversation with this book to really unpack and say, Africa isn't a country. When one African country isn't you know, doing great, it doesn't mean the entire continent isn't doing great. Africa is a continent of 55 individual countries to 1.2 billion people speaking more than 2000 languages we are we are you know th there's a lot more to our narrative that that is often shared and that layer the layer of the narrative still needs to be there the way that we perceive africa the way that we treat africa we are seen as a recipient and yet at the same time africa is the is the birthplace of ubuntu which i personally think could be one of Africa's greatest gifts to the world. We know what it means to be part of a community and the world, I think the world could learn something from us. Did you think about calling your book, I am a girl from Zimbabwe or? No, and, and, no it, it was never going to be a choice. I remember when I was six years old and my, my gogo, -go, my grandmother explained to me what it means to be African, right? And she told me, I am Mwana Wevu which is the Shona word, Shona is my language in Zimbabwe, which literally translates to a child of the African soil. And she explained to me that before I was Zimbabwean or anything else, I was for, first and foremost a child of the African soil. And also what's remarkable for me is that when you speak, you know, I hang out with my community anywhere in the world, even in New York, we as Africans, we, we love the fact that we're Africans, we embrace the fact that we're Africans, the problem is when the rest of the world doesn't understand the nuance that you cannot blanket an entire or dismiss an entire continent because of one country that isn't performing according to how we want it to perform. So no, it was always going to be a child of the African soil. I am a girl from Africa and I'm very proud. What would you think your go, -go would say to you if she saw you now with your books? Oh, very proud very proud she um this is a, a passage in the book the very first time when i went back home after i was i got my job with the un which was a very <laughs> one of the most challenging thing that i'd ever done because at some point it felt like the dream was never going to happen i went home and go go it was again sort of we, we were recovering from another drought and things weren't as great as they needed to be but she still sacrificed, she slaughtered a goat to celebrate my coming home. And we sat down uh, after the celebration and she took my hand and put in a hand. And she said to me, I've always wondered why a child is born with their fist clenched. Now I know my dear child, you were born clenching your blessings. And so I think she'll be very proud. I think she will say, this is what I meant. You were born with your blessings. Well, we have another question, which is slightly different, which is what are the categories of field work that the UN undertakes? It's from someone who's a black mature woman, who's an archeologist, who was wondering, you know, are there roles for the, in the UN for people who are archeologists say, if you know, you've done, such, you've done such a good job of selling the mission of the UN. <laughs> And I can't stress it strongly enough, you know, because never, even before Donald Trump spent four years attacking the UN in a very aggressive way, and even before he, you know, spoke about, you know, SHT holes being, you know, sort of, you know, places of the world he didn't like, there was a sense amongst many people that the UN was a stuffy bureaucracy, wasn't doing anything. You know, you presented such a shining inspiring face of the UN that it's really quite different. So yeah, so archaeologist says, can I come and work for the UN too? Absolutely. All you have to do if you go to UNESCO.org. Right, UNESCO. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, actually, I know UNESCO. UNESCO did some wonderful work in the um, along the Silk Road when I was doing my PhD out in Tajikistan, studying Central Asian history. Yeah. So a wonderful part of the world. Um, I have a few other questions. Um, one thing I'd love to ask you, by the way, is why yellow? <laughs> so ye yellow is my favorite color because it reminds me of this bright, beautiful yellow skies I used to wake up to in my small village. So from the age of five, I was in charge of Gogo's goats. So I would wake up early in the morning with 11 goats and I was in charge of tying them up in the bush so that they wouldn't wander into our field and eat our crops. And I remember it was a lot of work, you know, like stubborn goats just running all over the place. And I remember almost every other time when I was done, I was panting out of out of air for breath and I was out of out of breath. I would always like lock my arms behind my back and look up. And there I my eyes made the most beautiful all yellow skies. And uh. and it allowed me to dream, you know, there was sort of this like anything is possible. And I even remember as young as five thinking, well, one day I would like to own a yellow dress so, th so that I can be as pretty as the African sky. And so now I can buy a yellow dress and it's, it's a way of taking a piece of Africa with me. Oh, that's wonderful. I must say, I used to, when I was doing my field work as an anthropologist in Tajikistan, I used to look after the goats with the kids. And if you've not looked after goats, you don't realize how exhausting it is. It's exhausting. The nightmare finding goats. <laughs> I used to spend an hour each day running up and down the mountains looking for goats. Um, and when it rains, and they hate the rain, so when it rains, they even get more crazy, and you're just chasing them all over the place. And they hide, yes. Anyone who's tried to catch goldfish, it's nothing like that. But um, my, my other question um, is, you know, which I'm really curious about, and I'm sure many people watching um, will wonder, and anyone who's read, read the book will wonder, is so what is your dream now what next do you dream of going back to zimbabwe or going back to different african countries to try and you know galvanize women help women there um do direct work on the ground um do you want to stay within the united nations or are you interested in other types of um roles in the future because i would imagine there will be a queue around the block of people wanting to employ you but um, i'm kind of curious you know what is your dream yeah. now so my husband makes a joke that I'm always searching for impact. And so my dream, I think, will always remain the same. I'm always trying to figure out a way that I can create more impact in the world. Because when I reflect upon my own journey, you know, we spoke about the drought. There were so many other children that didn't make it that died during the drought. And it's not lost on me that my life must have been saved for a very, very important reason. And that reason, in my own understanding, is that so that I can pay it forward, so that I can create as much impact as I can possibly make. So I don't really have a fixed sort of this is what I would do next. All I know is that I will always, always continue to search for impact. I'm a political scientist by training, so I'm also not saying, you know, I'm not saying no to your potential career where I can contribute directly to my to my country and my continent down the line. But really the, the idea of creating impact is what gets me up in the morning. Well, yeah, well, watch this space, I can imagine. Did you ever feel guilty about the fact that you survived? Yes, yes, I did. I, did. I mean, I, that because I shouldn't be, statistically, I shouldn't be alive. Um, and, you know, I feel very surprised to be alive still. Um, but um, from your point of view, I was curious because knowing that you survived partly by accident um, and, you know, someone found you, um, yeah. you know, it, it leaves a kind of sense of, you know, of guilt. I mean, I was, I was in a yeah. coma. I was very ill. I was found at one stage. So again, wow. by sheer, sheer accident. And I was wow. curious because it certainly, it leaves you with, you know, a sense of not guilt, but a sense of also that you need to try and do something with the rest of your life in a way. Yeah. You need, you need to make that life matter. Yes. I mean, I, I, I felt guilty and it was further compounded by the fact that I then at the age of 10 learned about my own siblings whom I'd never really met before that. And they were living in one of the most impoverished conditions. And my father and my mother were the most hardworking people and remained for the most hardworking people that I, I, I've ever known. But even then they still couldn't make ends meet. 
And I suddenly realized, I mean, there I am at this British school and there are my siblings, you know, living such a contrast of a life. And, and I, I was able to then turn that guilt and saying, well, this, this is now giving me a new purpose, right? Like I have to be part of uplifting their lives as well. And so that's how I was able to reconcile the whole thing. But yeah, I felt, I felt rather guilty. So we have a question here, which is that, um, what are some of your own favorite books when you were writing your book? Um, and aside from your gogo, are there other people who are your heroes or heroines who you've looked to? Yes. So I'll start with the second question, actually, because the book also talks a lot about a woman called Pumzile Mulambunguka, and she is the head of UN Women, which is the UN entity on gender equality. From the age of 14, I idolized this woman. In fact, I learned about her during the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. She, she had been a freedom fighter. She was then appointed by Nelson Mandela to be on his cabinet. And I just remember at the time as a 14 year old thinking, oh my God, I can't even believe that a woman can, can, can lead a country and can be part of you know, a team that's leading a country and really bring South Africa out of a very, very difficult uh, um, sort of history. And then, of course, a few years later, in 20, 2005, she became one of the most powerful women on the African continent when she was appointed as the deputy president of South Africa. And then I had the privilege of becoming a senior advisor at the UN. And it was really her visionary leadership, her disruptive sort of I, understanding of what needed to happen to create something that was very different to how we're approaching gender equality that enabled he for she to see the light and day. So she is my biggest role model. Um, she is, I think, to so many girls on our continent, just the one woman we look up to. In terms of books, I read so much stuff, um, but I think one person, if I have to pinpoint the person that inspired me the most, is Chinua Achebe. There was something about his work that gave me permission to write my book in the way that I needed to write it in an African way where it wasn't trying to be something that it wasn't, you know, in his own literature, he uses local languages in my own literature. I use local languages. I also got really inspired to, to tell the book in present tense, which is not the easiest thing, uh, but I wanted people to really feel and have a sense of, what it felt like being in that moment with me. I wanted to, to see what I see and feel what I feel. And Chinua Achebe did that for me. You know, he made it acceptable that we could write a different kind of literature and it would still be beautiful literature. Yeah, well, I think that's something which just come through very powerfully in the book. And I think one of the things that, again, come through very powerfully is part from the lyrical sense of weaving these stories together is the way that you jump forward and then back and then forward and back and it really gives a wonderful wonderful sense of the passage of time and also the interconnectedness of it how yeah. did you find the actual writing process i'm just curious did you find it painful to write about yourself in that way it's a very weird thing i'm a very very private person and so it took a lot of internal convincing to actually want to do it but then I realized that, you know, if I don't tell my story, then someone else may tell my story. And, and I thought it was important that I actually do justice to that narrative and that I would use my own story to also share the things that I've always wanted to share, this other side of my beautiful African continent that we don't often get to hear about through the media. But so once I got to this point of saying, I'm going to do this, it was actually quite liberating. I found that I had a lot of things that, that I, I'd wanted to say and I just sat down and, and it all came out and it was, it was freeing on some level. And just lastly, because we're almost out of time, as someone who is a writer, who's just been, you know, spent the last year writing my own book and which I found very hard to write because a lot of it's quite personal. Um, so I'm very impressed that you managed to do it and didn't find it too excruciating. How do you do it? Do you, did you sort of get up at three in the morning at the United Nations before your day job and write it for an hour or two? Did you take time off? I'm just curious. I always love to ask people this. No. So, so actually, I mean, I live in a very drafty New York apartment and 
I created my own sort of bedroom, became my what I called my writing nook. And I would literally just sort of sit there um, and then just write. And sometimes it was like 16 hours. And before I knew it, you know, time had just flown by because once I started writing, you know, the words didn't stop and it, it just kept coming. So it was, I think the biggest challenge though for me was the structure, right? Because I literally got all the story out and I thought, and it was in chronology, right? Chronological order. And, and I read it and I thought, I don't know if it's doing justice to the story. It felt a little flat to kind of go step by step by step. And I had to come up with this sort of new way of weaving the story, which is why you end up seeing in the book that it's really sort of everything grounds back to my home in Zimbabwe and in Africa. And then it sort of it provides the basis for understanding how I see the world, why I do the things that I do, and it's all informed by my upbringing. And so that for me, that was the difficult thing, just getting the structure to a place where it would do service to the story. And also my, my incredible publisher, Nan Graham, and my editor, Sally Howard Scribner, they were both saying, you know, we've got to do justice to this story. So go back and, you know, think about a different way of, of, of structuring it. And we ended up with a, a really, really beautiful narrative. Well, I'm very, already awestruck and uplifted by the story of your life and by the work you're doing. But to hear that you were able to sit down and write for 16 hours a day without interruption um, <laughs> leaves me even more awestruck and even more impressed. But, um, but thank you very much indeed for an astonishing book. Um, thank you for a really astonishing and uplifting life. And thank you for a very uplifting conversation and I started off by saying at the beginning that I thought that that dash of resilience, optimism and a desire to not just seek healing but a communal journey together of people helping each other is a spirit that frankly we all need right now of whatever colour, wherever we live and whatever our circumstances. So you, it's Gina. very appropriate that you are a burst of yellow. We need <laughs> yellow these days. So thank you very much indeed, and best of luck with the next step of your book discussion, promotion, and journey. And best of luck also with the next step of your life, because I have absolutely no doubt that it's going to be quite something. So thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Gillian. And um, I'm going to do one more recruitment call for people who want to create change in our world. I'm going to leave with one of my favorite African proverbs. And it says, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try spending a night in a room with a mosquito. So as you can see, none of us are too small to make a difference. And I hope this event today inspired you and sparked your, again, desire to want to make a difference in the lives of others, because we only rise when we uplift others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us tonight. On screen, we are showing closing slides. This slide contains an image of the featured book. The cover shows a photograph of the author in profile from the shoulders up against a bright yellow background. The text reads, Elizabeth Yamiaro, a memoir, I am a girl from Africa. I am a girl from Africa is available for purchase online from the library shop on.nypl.org slash shop live. Proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Reserve a copy for free with a New York Public Library card. Visit tonight's event page to find this title in a variety of formats, nypl.org slash live. The last slide shows live from NYPL upcoming events. Wednesday, April 21st, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Names of New York. Joshua Jelly Shapiro with Suketu Meta. Thursday, April 29th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. A Thousand Years of Persian Poetry by Women. Readings, Music, and Conversation. Tuesday, May 4th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. The Mysteries. Marissa Silver with Jennifer Egan. Co-presented with the Dorothy and Lewis B. Cullman Center for Scholars and Writers. For more information and to register, visit nypl.org slash live.